Hey everyone, John here from the Cast and Spear podcast, and today we have on the show Dustin McIntyre, the owner of Gatku and Chris Pole Spears, and he has been gracious enough to share a little bit about how he got started in spearfishing. I know a lot of listeners aren't necessarily Spearos, but have been kind of asking, how do I get into it? What do I have to think about? What do I have to mentally prepare before my first dive? And Dustin does an excellent job explaining how he got into it a long time ago, and then what kept him spearfishing and what you know what really got him addicted to wanting to go out season after season after season and then finally he goes into what to do once you plateau because i know a lot of people who put a lot of time into it will eventually hit a limit then you're going to need to do one more step to kind of get over that hump and move on to bigger and better things but before we get started if you haven't already done so please subscribe to the podcast so you never miss a future episode and one more thing if you find yourself wanting a pole spear at the end of this podcast Definitely go to gatku.com and use promo code John Spear, and Dustin will throw you a free dive knife and a few other goodies along with any pole spear purchase. So a massive thank you, Dustin. That's going to help a lot of Spearos get into the game for the first time. So without further ado, let's welcome Dustin McIntyre. I think I was 15 or 16 years old the first time I participated in spearfishing. First time I tried it out, I was at a beach camp here in Southern California and at uh, Carlsbad State Beach. And um, and a guy I, I respected there as a fisherman, he had a, a pole spear leaning up against his truck and had a paralyzer head on it, a three-prong. And I said, uh, hey, man, do you mind if I borrow that you know, for a little while? He said, yeah, go for it. No problem. So I grabbed it. I'm like, well, I need some fins and a mask. So I turned back around. Hey, do you have any fins and a mask I can borrow? So like, yeah, hold, hold on. So he hands me fins and a mask and then i was ready i went out and the first school of fish i said i could i could get that so i load up that pole spear took the fish and he also gave me a game bag that i was able to just kind of hang on to <laughs> i didn't have any belt or anything to strap it to so i take that first fish and and, and you know underwater everything's bigger and i'm like, ah, i got this monster i'm gonna do that again so i take four more so i had this bag of of five zebra perch <laughs> So I bring it up to bring it up to this guy, who, uh, you know, he's looking. He's noticing I got a, a heavy bag. And I'm like, look what I got! Look what I got! Are they good eating? He's all, no. What you got there is about about eight or nine pounds of bait. <laughs> you got to chop it up first, though. And uh, I didn't have the heart to do that. I, I was going to bring it home and and eat it anyways. And man, in my head, that was the noble thing to do. You know, I just I just killed these five fish. And it wasn't right. I mean, it, out of respect for the fish, I had to eat them. So I brought them home, not knowing how to prepare them, not knowing what to do. <laughs> and I remember I, I, I put them in the freezer because I was afraid my mom would yell at me for making them, making the refrigerator smell. And so I had to let them thaw out, and they had a severe case of freezer burn by the time I actually conjured up the courage to cut them up and start preparing it. And it was a mess. It was just a slaughter. And... The, for those of you that know what the zebra perch taste like, they're not really designed for human consumption. But um, but I like grinned and I tried to get through it. I probably ate at least one whole fish before I just gave up and said no more. <laughs> this is gonna go. It's gonna go in the flower bed. It became some compost. But the funny part of the story is a guy that I borrowed that first pole spear from uh, later became my father-in-law. I married his daughter like 10 years later and he was he was my end to spearfishing um so that's a cool part of that story and then of course later when i was trying to woo him and his daughter and courting his daughter and and um, trying to make sure that he was he was impressed with my skills as a hunter um i would always like pull up pull up to where he worked and said hey man i got something to show you and uh you know, I'd show him the latest, latest and greatest, you know, sea bass in the back of my, in the back of my car, and we'd we'd talk fishing for a long time, and it was in those conversations that we had where I I knew I'd like had this rite of passage, I gained his respect and and his trust, and he later trusted me with his daughter. So so I, I kind of felt like like uh, like he was my end to spearfishing, and then spearfishing became the end to me acquiring my spouse thanks spearfishing 
And it wasn't just a fad thing, right? I had, I was always involved in water sports and a lot of other uh, extracurricular activities as, as a kid and, and things of interest would come and go. They were seasonal. You know, I was really into BMX. I was really into wrestling. Um, those were parts of my life, but as soon as I engaged in spearfishing, uh, it like became part of me. Like you're, if you were to ask me, I, uh, how many times you go spearfishing this year? You know, it might be less than last year, but I could guarantee you that next year I'm going and I'm not going to stop going. It's just, that's just what I do. I'm never going to not have spearfishing gear in my garage. Um, it's always going to be a passion of mine. It's always going to be, it's like this addiction that never, never, will, never, never has and never will go away. Here, Dustin gives you his recommendations for what to do when you plateau as a Spiro. I think everybody goes from novice to intermediate to expert with just about anything that they, that they hang on to for a long time. And I could remember I was just getting into figuring out how to hold my breath longer, figuring out what gear I needed, what gear I didn't need. No one walks into it doing everything right. I mean, you're trying to hold your breath. You're, you're trying to relax and, and try and overcome fear of, of a shark or something in the dark behind the kelp. You know, this is, this is a learned behavior. It's not natural for us to, to be 50 feet below the surface, really. So I, um, I, I reached a, a point where I, I got past the fear. I, f- I figured out how to dive a few spots. And, and then I found out that right behind those kelp stocks, where I was always kind of afraid to go, I, I, I saw a sea bass. I'm like, man, that thing was as big as me. And, um, and I knew that I didn't, have, I didn't have the skills necessary to go after that. And I, I definitely didn't have the gear. Right. So I had this new, new addiction within my addiction. When I shot my first white sea bass, it was on like for 10 years, it was on like every season I was going out right when those sea bass came in. And, and, and within that 10 year period, there was also like an addiction that I had for going out after lobsters. It was like the, the gateway drug it had unfolded and I wasn't ready for it. Like, okay, this I'm, I'm graduating now. And I need a professor and I, and I had, um, I had a friend after, you know, five years of spearfishing and, uh, figured out four to five good shore diving spots and kind of had my, my secret holes. And then I, I kind of like plateaued out skill wise until I found a guru, right. Or I found somebody who knew more than I did. So my friend, Kevin, who was older than me, had a lot of experience under his belt, did, did a bunch of Baja trips and, you know, had uh, acquired, you know, through spearfishing a lot bigger fish than I ever, ever had. And he had a boat and he had extra gear to lend to me. You know, I was just a poor, starving college student with, with no money to extend to this ongoing habit of spearfishing. You know, it's an expensive sport. Like, and you get into it, you're like, I want to go after the, the larger fish or the more elusive fish. And you start acquiring more gear and figuring out that this more expensive gear might work out better. And, and I, I think I need a boat or I need a kayak or uh, I need this wetsuit. Um, and you could jump into thousands of dollars pretty quick. And I didn't have that money but this guy had extra gear. And so it worked out. It was like this real cool relationship where I, I all of a sudden had a mentor in, in the sport that I loved. And I, I grew more during just a couple of seasons with a more seasoned veteran. And I, it was just, it was a, it was a growing spurt skill wise, even outside the water. I learned an incredible amount. I see Kevin, he, he, uh, he was a craftsman also, and he taught me how to make my very first, uh, spear gun out of a piece of teak. In fact, he acquired this piece of teak for me that was already laminated. So like the, the, that part was already done. And then, um, I was a machinist. And so I'm like, well, what does it need to look like? What, what do we need? What hardware do we need? And, and, um, uh, he literally stood there with me next to my mill while I was running it. And, he said, yep, that looks good. Okay, yeah, yeah, make this pocket a little bit longer. Um, yeah, that should work out just fine. Yeah, that's straight enough. 
And it was awesome. And I'm grateful for that period of time in my life where I was able to take my passion and share it with with somebody. And he was able to share with me what I didn't know. And um, and we, we grew together. It was it was great. He's, he's a great friend of mine to this day. And so I, I highly encourage people to get out there and find somebody who knows more than they do about the sport and who might keep them safer, keep them in the right direction, keep them from spending too much money um, on things they don't need, assist them with with uh, creating homemade gear and possibly show you some secret diving spots. <laughs> but really the, the best part about spearfishing, I think the most fulfilling part is finding your own your own spots. A lot of locals come to me and ask me, hey, where do you go? And I'll, I'll send them all to the same spot because that was my old stomping grounds. But I, I know that, that if they go there, they're going to acquire an appetite and they're going to want to find other spots. And really, the other spots are your spots. You're going to find them. So get out there and find them. Well, that does it for this episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope if you haven't tried spearfishing yet that this was the episode that nudges you just a little bit more towards trying it. If you have trouble figuring out gear, definitely go to the Cast and Spear website. We have plenty of articles that will help point you in the right direction or go hit up your local favorite dive shop. And if you're having trouble finding dive buddies, try spearboard.com. I actually found somebody's number who was in LA and they just actually put their phone number on a post and I shot them a text and they took me to one of their spots and we still dive together to this day. So the community is really open. You know, they might not just give you like the hot spots. And like Dustin said, that's your job to, over time to kind of find those yourself. But usually if you reach out, most will take you out and kind of show you the ropes. We've all been there before. It's not easy getting started and it can be a little bit scary. But there's some quality guys and girls that are doing this in your local area. So just reach out to them and I'm sure that they will take care of you and get you started. And if you haven't already done so, please take a screenshot of your podcast app and text it to three of your fishing buddies. I want to help spread the word and make this the best fishing podcast on the web. And with that, keep those lines tight, everyone. See ya.